Thank you, Willie, and thank you to all the men that have led us in our services this morning. I'd encourage you, if you have a Bible, to open to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 14. We're going to start there in just a moment, Luke chapter 14. I will say more this evening, but let me uh, just say once again how thankful I am uh, to you for extending the invitation to be with you. You have treated me so kindly during the time that I have been here and I appreciate so much the chance to get to know saints. It's an amazing thing that, uh, you know, you can have people that you've never met before in your life, and yet when we share a common faith in our Lord, there is a closeness and a connection that we can come to feel almost immediately, and I've appreciated that in the time that we've spent together. I want to say just a, a word or two about David as well. I am so impressed with the work that he is doing here and the impact that he is having here and in Alaska generally in the meetings that I did prior to this. Um, I can't tell you the kind and uh, supportive things that people said about David. The congregation where I preach in Olson, at Olson Park in Amarillo has supported, helped David with his support for a number of years. And I had, of course, planned after this trip to give some type of report to them, but it's interesting how things have worked out because I was planning to go to a preacher study in Alabama after this uh, next Monday and Tuesday. Uh, I will be in, in Alabama for that, but it turned out that I'm actually going to speak at a congregation in Birmingham, Vestavia, that also helps David with his support, and when uh, they were talking to me about that, they asked if I would kind of do a report on the work up here as well, and so uh, I'm, I'm excited about that, the way that it worked out, and I uh, have nothing but good to report about all that I've seen here, uh, the work that the Lord's people are doing in Alaska. But we'll say some more about those things tonight. Let's read together Luke chapter 14, verses 27 through 33. Jesus speaking says, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000, or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. You know, in our efforts this week, and I'm certain that in David's efforts generally, there is a constant appeal to try to urge those that have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and become Christians to do so. But I think these words that we've read in this text offer to us something that is important for us to consider, and that is, while well, yes, we hope that, we seek that any who have the desire and uh, are truly to the point of coming to faith would be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus' words in this text teach us that we need to consider the cost of that. Now that's not to discourage it, but it's, it's really just a recognition that there are some things at stake, there are some things that are going to be involved in that. And it would be naive for someone to go into that process thinking that there is nothing that will be sacrificed, there's nothing that it involves that may not be difficult. So this morning I'd like for us to think a little bit about what we might call the stakes of the gospel. And we're going to really just look at three things and then the lesson will be yours. I want us to ask the question first of all, what do you have to lose? by obeying the gospel. Now that may seem a little strange 
Because usually when we're talking about the gospel, we're talking about eternal life. We're talking about a relationship with God and Christ. And certainly those are things that we seek and we want to gain. But are there any things that you will lose if you obey the gospel? Well, I think we need to recognize that there are. You're going to lose some time. Uh, go with me to the text that we spent a little bit of time with last night when, in our lesson on whether the Christian should drink alcohol. Remember in 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, as we read some things in this text, we noticed that section where you have three different types of drinking that are described as those things that we've left behind. But I want us to notice just the first three verses here and consider what it tells us about the time that we will have if we obey the gospel. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For you have spent enough, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and uh, abominable idolatries. And remember, that's the list we looked at. But notice here, here both in, at the end of verse 2 and in verse 3, you've spent enough time doing those things. You're going to have to give up a little bit of time that you might have chosen to do other things. You're going to have to sacrifice a little bit of time that you are going to devote in service to the Lord. You're going to have to give up, and you're going to have to lose a little bit of fun. It would be a lie if I were to stand up here or any preacher were to stand up here and say, you know, there's nothing that is pleasurable about sin, and if you become a Christian and only do those things that are pleasing to God, there's nothing you're going to have to sacrifice. Over in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, that great chapter of faith that I mentioned in our previous lesson, as it describes one such man of faith, Moses, it describes that he chose uh, to surrender the passing pleasures of sin. There's going to be some fun that you're going to have to give up. It may well be that you also have to sacrifice some friends. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We recognize that if one obeys the gospel... That there will be those that perhaps they'd had friendships with before that don't come with them, don't attain that same faith. And so the Bible will teach us that as Christians, there are going to be some choices we have to make. And we can't allow ourselves to be put in a position in which, as the text will put it, we're unequally yoked with those that could lead us in the wrong direction. Notice the text says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of God, the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Now, that's not to say you won't have friends, and that's not to demand that you can't have any kind of contact or association with those that are non-Christians, but certainly it can never be the kind of thing in which they are doing the influencing rather than you doing the influencing. So you may have to... Uh, lose some friends. You may have to lose some family. Over in Luke chapter 14 and verse 26, Luke chapter 14 and verse 26, I want you to notice a statement that Jesus makes that may seem a little bit shocking. It is in the gospel of Jesus Christ that we learn the very best way that family ought to live, the way in which we ought to treat one another, the kind of husbands and wives and fathers and mothers and children that we ought to be. And yet, when there are those times in which it comes down to an issue of serving God or loyalty to our family, Jesus says here in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, 
wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus, I think, is using hyperbole here to a certain extent in the fact that in other gospel accounts, it will be the idea of you can't love them more, but there may be those times in which we'll have to actually sacrifice and lose the kind of relationship we had with our family when we did not serve Christ. There are going to be some habits that you're going to have to lose and have to give up. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I believe that we looked at this text earlier in our studies this week as well, this past week. Colossians chapter 3. Let's read together beginning in verse 5. And notice just a few things that can no longer contain you if we're going to be serving Christ faithfully. It describes it as putting to death certain things. Colossians 3, beginning of verse 5, says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, out of your mouth. You know, you, it may be that you cursed uh, frequently uh, as a non Christian. Well, hopefully, as a Christian, you've put that off and you should put that off. Notice verse 9 do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. You may have to lose some habits that just came natural in the past, but now you can no longer live that way. There may be some things that you've got to lose as well. John in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 admonishes us not to love the world or the things of the world, if anyone loves the, the, the world, uh, the love of the Father is not in him. And so there, there may be some things that you just devoted yourself to, and now you realize that in Christ, those things are an obstacle to your service. You may have to also, <coughs> excuse me, lose some choices that you have in your life. Over in Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, Notice in verse 24, powerful statement that Jesus makes about what it means to serve him and to follow him. Jesus says, the text says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him, notice, deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If I have to deny myself, it can't just be anymore that it's everything I want to do. It's all the things that I choose there are going to be some things that I look at what the Word of God says and what my Lord says, and I've got to sacrifice my choices to what the Lord intends for me in life. All right, so we've seen some things that we'll have to lose. Well, let's shift gears now and ask the question, what do you have to gain by obeying the gospel? Now, there are some that I think are a little bit obvious, forgiveness of sins, a relationship with God and Christ, the hope of eternal life, and we'll touch a little bit on some of those things. But I want to, in some ways, kind of look at the other side of the coin of some of these ideas that we've just looked at. For example, you're going to gain time well spent. You know, there are ways you spent your time before, but I want to submit to you that now in Christ, when you're worshiping the Lord and serving the Lord, you're serving His people, you are serving His cause, you're trying to lead others to Christ, that's time, but it's time well spent. And it's going to be profitable to you, both spiritually, emotionally, it's going to be that which is beneficial. You're going to find that it's not going to be that you're always going to have a frown on your face and you can never uh, smile or enjoy anything. You're going to have fun. There will be things that you'll be able to enjoy as a Christian but it will be things that are meaningful. Go to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, and I call your attention to this text that talks to us about the fruit of the Spirit. And this kind of echoes what we talked about in our lesson about the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit 
inspired the word and inspired the gospel if, as Romans 8 verse 5 teaches, we walk in the Spirit when we set our mind on the things of the Spirit, what's going to grow out of that? Well, fruit of the Spirit will grow out of that. Uh, Galatians 5 verse 22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Now remember, we talked a little bit about some relationships that we may have to lose. Does that mean you're just going to be on your own and there'll be no association, no friendships? Not at all. You're going to have a fellowship of co-believers. 1 John chapter 1, the Apostle John begins this short, little, beautiful epistle talking to us about the reason that he writes to them. And I want you to notice with me how he puts it here. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Notice verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. I mentioned at the beginning that here I, I had never met most of you in the flesh before, and yet we have now a kinship. The fact that we share faith with one another allows us, just as this text talks about, we have fellowship with the Father, and that then creates automatic fellowship with one another. Yes, we may have to lose some friends, lose some uh, associates, but we gain so much more because you're going to have those, perhaps even that you've never met, that you have that kinship with. You're going to have a family of co-workers. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, I want you to notice the way that this is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and in verse 9. It puts it this way, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Ephesians 3 and verse 15 speaks of it as a family, both in heaven and in earth. Yes, there will be some kinds of family relations that may be strained or may be sacrificed if you don't share faith, but you gain a spiritual family with those that you may not have met before, but all of a sudden you've got brothers and sisters in Christ. You've got those who have the goal of heaven set before them. Now we mentioned that you're going to have to lose some habits. Well, you're going to gain some healthy habits. One, for example, is mentioned over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. It speaks of the, the household of Stephanus. And dep depending upon your translation, New King James will put it that they devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I think there's one out there that puts it that they were addicted to the ministry of the saints. And I'll tell you what, that is behavior. That, those are habits that are good habits. You're going to have to give up some things, but you're not just left in a vacuum and a void. You take on some new things. And you're going to gain some necessary things. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, our Lord teaches that we're not to worry about the things of this life, but we are to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And we'll have the things that we need, but his kingdom and his righteousness are necessary things. Let's notice two other points in this connection, and we're going to draw them both from Revelation chapter 21. Turn to Revelation chapter 21, and we'll look first in verse 3. And these perhaps are among those that are obvious in some respects. I mentioned that we obey the gospel because of the hope of eternal life that we have. But as we think about all these things we may sacrifice, will not eternal life in the age to come with our God be worth it all? Listen to how this is described in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, 
The tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. I have enjoyed so much this week staying with the Halbrooks. They've just treated me like a, a king and just taken care of every need that I have. And I enjoy that. And no offense, but i got to tell you, I want to live with God more than I w the way in which I was treated special this week. I, I want to live with God more than being able to return home. Imagine that time in which we'll live with God. The one who's responsible for any joy you and I have ever known. Can you imagine living in His presence, being with Him? Tell you what, as we think about what we lose, if we compare this with what we gain, it, it just pales in comparison. But notice the next verse, verse 4, describes the joy and the peace and the satisfaction that will come. Our best days in this life still are plagued with hardship and suffering and difficulty. We'll have those times when things won't go well. We'll have those times where we lose a loved one. But notice verse 4 says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Those are some powerful things to gain by obeying the gospel. Well, as we bring our lesson to an end, I want to kind of look at one last angle. We talked about what do you have to lose by obeying the gospel. We talked about what you have to gain by obeying the gospel. But I want to end by asking this question. What do you have to lose by not obeying the gospel? There may be some that as they hear our lesson this morning, they may say, okay, well, that, that sounds really good, preacher, but I, you know, I'd still just rather live my own life. I'd rather do my own things. I don't want to have to be accountable to that. Well, you have that choice. God is not going to force your faith and force your obedience. But in full disclosure, as we sometimes speak of, you need to know what the stakes are of that choice as well. And we need to understand that in a very real sense, you know, we may not want to sacrifice a little bit of time in service to our Lord. If you don't obey the gospel in a very real way, you're going to lose all time. Now, I don't mean by that that you'll go out of existence. But I mean that, you know, now... We have a choice over how we spend our time, and we want pleasurable time. But if I no longer will ever experience that, it is as if all time has gone away. Turn to Revelation chapter 14 with me for a moment. Revelation chapter 14. This text is a chilling text, but I think it's important for us to understand. If we imagine that, well, I can rebel against God and I'll never be called to account for it, I, or I'll rebel against God and He'll just annihilate me and I'll pass out of existence. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, firmly refutes any such notion. Notice here, as we see these visions that are a part of the book of Revelation, verse 9 begins, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they shall have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives his mark, uh, who receives the mark of his name. If I do not obey the gospel in a very real way, I will lose all joy. Don't imagine that, well, I, I want to sow my wild oats here, and then I'll be with the rebels in heaven, and we'll just have one, or in hell, and we'll just have one big party in hell. That's not the picture that is painted. 
We've just seen here in Revelation chapter 14 the horrifying description. Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 51, there in describing eternal punishment as well, it speaks of it as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. What a contrast. Eternal life with God, no more tears. Separation from God in conscious eternal torment in hell will be a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's a very real sense as well in which if I don't obey the gospel, I really am going to lose all friends and family. You know, in Luke chapter 20, verses 34 and 35, Jesus there teaches that you know, marriage is not going to be something that lasts beyond the judgment. So if we imagine, well, I'll hang with my sinful friends and my sinful family and enjoy things, being separated from God eternally. If marriage doesn't continue, I think the inference seems to be pretty clear. Those joys and pleasures that are a part of family and the bonds of marriage will not continue as well. Over in Luke chapter 16, Luke chapter 16, we have the account in verses 19 through 31 there where Jesus tells us about a rich man that had everything that he wanted, but he didn't serve God properly. A poor man that begged at his gate that did serve God properly. And when they die, the, the text is not describing uh, final reward and punishment after judgment. It is describing what Scripture speaks of in the Old Testament as Sheol and the New Testament as Hades. And the Bible indicates to us that all the dead go to this place and are separated. And the Bible teaches us in the book of Revelation that one day uh, the dead will come out of Hades and Sheol and be judged and then either go to heaven or to hell. But I call our attention to this text in Luke chapter 16 because we might imagine that, well, I can still, even if I'm separated from God and I don't go to heaven, there's still choices I can make. I can choose where I want to be. I think Luke chapter 16 teaches us some things about that. Because you realize that as it describes, even in the Hadean realm, the condition of the rich man, he is in torment. He can't even cool uh, the tip of his tongue with water. He can't make an appeal back to his family, all choice seems to be forfeit. And I think that's important for us to recognize. And you know, we mentioned that in obeying the gospel, we have to give up some things. But turn with me over to Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. And I want us to notice the statement that is made about the hope of the child of God. And by contrast, I think we then have to consider what that tells us about those that are not children of God, that have not obeyed the gospel. Notice, uh, as it talks about all that God has given us in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now, I don't understand how to wrap my mind around all of that. I don't think it's necessarily saying that you and I are going to be rulers of all of the universe. I don't think that. But in describing that the righteous receive all things, that must be understood as a contrast to what the unrighteous that are separated from God will not receive. I will not have the joys of the things that I may cling to here that prevent me from obeying the gospel. And I think it's important for us to understand, too, that, as I mentioned a moment ago, whether you are a Christian or whether you are not a Christian, you need to recognize very clearly that every joy that you've ever enjoyed every ability that you've ever had, every experience, I mean, whether you're talking about the beauties of nature that we witness around us so much here in Alaska, all of that is due to God. I want you to imagine for a moment 
if we even can, if our finite minds even can conceive it, what it would be like if every exposure to God, everything that God had ever blessed us with, all of a sudden was taken away. And I want you to notice a statement here in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 23 as we see the promise and the warning of what we will hear one day if we choose not to obey the gospel. Verse 23, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, I can choose not to obey the gospel, but if I do, I forfeit and I sacrifice an eternal relationship with God and all of that which God has blessed me with throughout my entire life is forfeit. But then finally, I want us to notice that really, you know, what is it that you and I own? What is it that you and I have any control over? I know that for a time it appears as if we have control over, you know, our home and our job and our food and our clothes. But really, we must recognize at any moment that could all change. We could at any moment find ourselves either disabled or uh, in a position in which we're dependent upon others or our life could pass from us at any moment. What we really own, the only thing any of us really owns, is our soul. And in one sense, that in itself is a trust. We're stewards to take care of it as God has entrusted that to us. Let's end with the text here in Matthew chapter 16, verses 26 and 27, where Jesus says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his angels, uh, uh, glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. Now that last phrase, that that kind of tells us some things we talked about in our first lesson, doesn't it? But notice here, if we seek to gain all of the happiness and joy and pleasure in this life, we don't want to obey the gospel. We don't want to be a Christian. But what's the consequence? We lose our soul. Friends, I hope that as we talked about these things this morning, it will challenge each of us to realize We do have a choice. Thanks be to God, He's given us a choice. We can obey the gospel. We can reject the gospel. But there are going to be consequences to that. And I would hope and urge you this morning, if you've never put your faith in Jesus as the Son of God, you've never had the faith to confess that before men, you've never had the commitment to to Uh, Commit yourself to turn away from sin that separates you from God. And then the courage to be baptized into Christ. Putting to death your old man, um, making those choices about a new life, and being raised to walk in newness of life. You need to do that. That is obedience to the gospel. It starts with that and continues as we abide in the Word of God. We can help you with that. Won't you come while we stand and sing?